American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Venerable Antonio Margil de Jesus, the Apostle of America and the Friar of the Winged Feet. He would evangelize a significant amount of Central America, Mexico, and present day Texas and Louisiana. He founded two colleges in Mexico as well as the first Catholic parish in the modern state of Louisiana and was planting missions in modern-day Texas a few decades before the more well-known St. Junipero Serra was doing the same in California. We actually got the beginning information for this episode from a priest friend of mine, Father Clinton Sensat of the Diocese of Lafayette, Louisiana. Father and I were at Mount St. Mary's at the same time. Father attests that when he stumbled upon Father Mogill's story three years ago, he was struck by his holiness, humility, and piety. So, as he relates it, I sought his intercession to help me grow in holiness three years ago, and he answered powerfully. Based on what we've learned about Father Margill, that is not at all surprising. No, not at all. Father Margill was known for his deep prayer life and self-abnegation from an early age. While he was still very young, he even adopted the practice of calling himself la misma nada, or nothingness itself. He was known for remarkable spiritual gifts. He was witnessed walking on water, bilocating. He could read souls, sense the presence of hidden pagan idols, enter rooms though the door was closed, and, it seems, fly. All of these gifts from God were for the service of spreading the gospel. And he's another one who came to this continent from Europe and gave himself to missionary work. Yes, he was born in Valencia, Spain in 1657 to poor parents. He was baptized and grew up in a solidly Catholic family. From an early age, he showed a devotion to prayer and humility. At 15, he entered the Franciscans and took instructions in philosophy and theology. He was an excellent student. He also took on extreme acts of penance and devotion as a young Franciscan. He would sleep very little and spend most of the night in prayer, especially the Stations of the Cross. He also would whip himself with iron chains as a means of sharing in the pains of Christ. This was also when he started his lifelong practice of signing his name along with La Misma Nada, nothingness itself. He also adopted a practice of fasting for most of the week, only eating substantial meals on Sundays. This practice would be part of his way of life until his death. He wished to remain a humble friar and not be ordained a priest, as St. Francis of Assisi had remained, but his superiors believed he could more effectively do what he was called to do as a priest, so they prevailed upon him to consent to being ordained. In 1683, he volunteered for missionary work in New Spain, so he boarded a ship in Cadiz to sail to North America. Incidentally, also sailing for the New World from Cadiz in 1683, maybe even on the same ship, was a Jesuit priest named Eusebio Kino. Kino was 12 years older than Margil, and while Margil was doing the evangelization thing in Central America, Mexico, and Eastern Texas, Western Louisiana, Kino was doing the same thing in Central and Western Mexico and modern-day Arizona. He was declared, Kino that is, Venerable in June of 2020, and we talked about the remarkable work of Eusebio Kino in episode 49. Check him out. Right. Venerable Eusebio Kino also introduced cattle ranching and modern farming methods to that region. He was incredible, and what a blessed year for missionaries from Cadiz. Seriously. So, Father Antonio Marguil de Jesus arrived in the New World in 1683 landing in Veracruz and with Mexico City as his home base. His immediate field of missionary activity was to the south, in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. So off he went, singing the alabado as he went along. While doing this work, his absolute devotion to evangelizing and bringing souls to Christ made him fearless. And miraculous gifts began to manifest. In one village, when he and his fellow missionary entered the chapel, chanting praise to God and carrying their crucifixes on high, the whole building trembled as though there were an earthquake. But no one else in the village experienced the earthquake. When the natives realized what was happening, they prostrated themselves before the two friars and admitted that they had hidden their idols within the church. 
Bringing pagan idols into Catholic churches was a common practice that Margiel and companions had to fight against. As they brought the people around to Christ, they would have the people bring their idols to the center of the village where they would burn them all in a heap. Because pagan idols have no place in churches built for sacrifice offered to the one true God. Of course not. Yeah, yeah. He was also able to prophesy the future, heal the sick, and he was known to be able to read souls, particularly sins of impurity. But then once those guilty of such sins confessed to him and he counseled them and gave them absolution, many found that they no longer suffered with the temptations to impurity. Among those whom he converted, he instilled the pious custom of greeting each other with Hail Mary, with the response back being conceived without original sin. What a beautiful way to say hello to one another. In more than one village, he and his companion were taken into custody and beaten and tortured. In at least two villages, the witch doctors and pagan chiefs ordered their execution by burning, but in one case, the wood simply wouldn't catch fire, and in another, the fire burning around the friars blackened their crucifixes, but did not even singe their hair. Sometimes these marvels led to conversions, and others the villagers expelled the missionaries and begged them not to bother them any longer. Margil covered many thousands of miles all over this region, and as a means of mortifying the body, he walked everywhere barefoot. He would not ride a horse nor in a cart. But it seems like he didn't always walk. Right. Some who accompanied him and his companions would note two things. First, that he frequently would stay behind to hear more confessions as his companions and their escort of soldiers was leaving town. But when they would arrive in the next town, they usually found him there already, waiting for them. Given the distances, his devotion to only walking, and the lack of alternate routes through the jungle, this sort of thing was only possible through divine intervention. When asked how he accomplished this, he would smile and say, I take shortcuts, and God helps. And second, his companions noted that, though he would have to cross rivers and streams to trek these miles, his feet were never wet. He never admitted anything, but one day a soldier in their escort pretended to be sleeping along the bank of a river he would have to cross to see how Father managed it. Sure enough, Father Magill came along and proceeded to walk right out across the water. After going partway across, Father turned back and walked over to the soldier, looked down at him and said, Now that you have seen it, Shoo. I wonder if at that point anything the Holy Fire did was a surprise to any of them. Seriously. So Margill and companions went around converting thousands, baptizing, building churches, burning idols, especially those hidden in churches, singing and enduring torture and near-death experiences. Margill actually quipped, the only thing he regretted was that he did not actually win the crown of martyrdom, but he was happy to accept what God willed to give. He did a lot of amazing work in the vineyard for decades. So it was in the latter portion of his life, after the turn of the 18th century, that his work took him north into present-day Texas and Louisiana. What compelled his shift of geography wasn't entirely sacred. To be sure, his focus remained the salvation of souls, but he was directed to head north for another reason. See, Spain had basically had a monopoly on exploration and settlement of North and Central America, south of modern-day Virginia. They had focused on Mexico, Central America, and the west coast of North America, but hadn't really turned their attention to the east and north of the Rio Grande. They figured they'd get to it eventually, but it would just be there for them until they got around to it. That all changed in the 1680s. French explorers led by de la Salle began to establish their own forts in present-day Louisiana and Mississippi. This development alarmed the Spanish authorities, who knew that they had to halt the French incursion into what they saw as their territory. Now, both the French crown and the Spanish crown saw the evangelization of the pagan natives as an indispensable part of political expansion. In fact, the way settlement was generally done by the Spanish was through establishing religious missions here and there with military garrisons or presidios nearby. The first incursion into this unsettled territory was in 1689, focusing on the Tejas tribe near modern-day San Antonio, but it wasn't well supplied or supported, and so it was abandoned within a couple of years. It wasn't a total wash, however. They did establish the first mission in modern-day Texas, the Mission San Francisco de los Tejas. And it is from that mission that the state of Texas actually got its name. Sure. But after they left in 1691, for more than 20 years, there was no new missionary activity. In 1716, the authorities organized their next effort, and this time they called in the big gun, Father Margill. 
By this point, Father Margill was nearly 60 years old, and his extreme regimen had taken its toll on his body. He had been pulled back from the missions in the south to establish a missionary college in Zacatecas, Mexico. He had been running this for a few years now and had shown himself a competent administrator and leader of men in formation for missionary work. But in spite of his advancing age and declining physical fitness, he was only too eager to take on the new mission field. But before he could join the group heading across the Rio Grande, he had to overcome a near deathly illness. He was actually given the last rite. He recovered and hurried along after them to join them. And now he was in what is today Texas and Louisiana. The first mission that Margil and companions founded was among the Nacogdoches Indians. Well, that's a tough one to say. Nacogdoches. <laughs> Near present-day Nacogdoches, Texas, which is... Yeah, I really hope I'm not completely messing that up. I know my Texas friends will tell me about it. Nacogdoches, which is about 130 miles north northeast of Houston and about 200 miles east northeast of San Antonio. It was quite a journey into the unknown. But for those who were there simply to share the gospel, no distance mattered at all. The conditions at the mission were difficult and provisions from the Spanish authorities were not plentiful. The friars had to work the land to cultivate food while also doing their work of evangelization and becoming familiar with the language of the natives. One writer said of Father McGill's work with the natives, he was kind and pleasant among the Indians as if he were their servant. They visited him at all hours. He bore up under their brashness and dispelled their ignorance. In a word, he cared for them as an earthly mother does for her son she loves. In 1717, one of his greatest and most enduring miracles occurred. A terrible drought gripped the region around Nacogdoches, and the vital Lanana Creek dried up. Crops failed. Starvation for the natives and the friars was imminent. Father Margill spent one night in solemn prayer for the plight of the natives and reportedly had a vision— the next day, he went out to a high bank in the creek bed, bringing with him sacred images and an iron rod. He knelt and prayed for a time, and then stood, and with the iron rod struck the rock of the bank, and suddenly outpoured two springs. These springs provided water to save the tribes and the mission. Pretty much just like Moses. I know, right? Those springs actually still flow into Lanana Creek in a park in the city of Nacogdoches. Very good. After a time, Margil moved about 30 miles east to another tribe, the Aist, whom the Nacogdoches had said would be open to receiving missionaries. Among the Aist, near the present-day city of St. Augustine, Texas, they founded the mission Nuestra Señora de los Dolores, or the Mission of Our Lady of Sorrows. Shortly after that, Father Margil moved even further east into present-day Louisiana, near modern Nacogdoches, where he established yet another mission, San Miguel de los Adais, or St. Michael of the Adais. This final mission was only a short distance from the French forts near the Nacogdoches, so while to Father Margil it was first and foremost a mission, a place where the sacraments were available and the gospel was preached, to the French and the Spanish it was a political statement. But Father Margil made the more centrally located mission, Our Lady of Sorrows, his base of operations, and travel to the other missions from there. But he didn't reserve his work to the Spanish missions. He would travel into French territory to see to the spiritual needs of the French soldiers who didn't have a priest nearby. When war formally broke out between the Kingdom of Spain and the Kingdom of France, the French vicar general in Mobile, who had jurisdiction in the region, commended Father Margil's zeal and bid him continue ministering to the French as well. But the political interfered. It wasn't long before the French troops attacked the mission of St. Michael ad Nacogdoches. One of the brothers escaped capture and rushed to tell Father Margil. He recognized that the friars and the few soldiers with them were no match for the French forces, so they all retreated to San Antonio to await support from the Spanish authorities. While in San Antonio, Father Miguel established the most important mission of his life, Mission San Jose y San Miguel de Aguayo, this would become one of the largest and most well-known missions in Texas. It wasn't until two years later, 1721, that the force was assembled and stepped off from San Antonio to retake the land the French had taken and to reestablish the missions. But this time, the Spanish would come and remain in enough force to ward off future attacks from the French. They found their missions destroyed, but rebuilt them. When they got to Nacatoches, which again is in present-day Louisiana, they actually declared that outpost to be the capital of the Texas Territory. So the first capital of Texas is actually in Louisiana. But anyhow, 
The friars were once again in the business of saving souls among the natives, bringing Christ to more and more ears and hearts. This time, their stay would be much more permanent. Father Miguel only had a short time left in this work, however, because he was pulled back to Mexico City in 1722 to be guardian or president of the college he had founded. He served in that role until 1725, when he returned to missionary work in Mexico. But his time was short. In early August 1726, he became very ill, and it was known that his last days were near. On August 5th, the night before his death, he venerated an image of Our Lady of Remedies and said to the Blessed Mother, Asa Manana, I'll see you tomorrow. Once again, he proved prophetic because early the next afternoon, he uttered his last words, now it is time to go and see God, and he died. He is buried in the Cathedral of the Assumption in Mexico City. 110 years after his death, Pope Gregory XVI affirmed his life to have been one of heroic virtue and thus declared the man who called himself nothingness itself venerable. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And support the work of SQPN. Your support at sqpn.com slash give helps make sure American Catholic History and all of the StarQuest podcasts remain available. To learn more about Fray Antonio Marguil de Jesus, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. <laughs> Those springs actually still flow into Lenanana? <laughs> Banana Creek? Oh my gosh. La na na. <laughs> it's la <laughs> Do 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 do